I would, um, yeah, I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Valerie Gibson, uh, Dr. Jessica Wade, and Professor uh, Rebecca Kilner. And I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves briefly before we go on to the discussion. So um, maybe we'll go to Val first. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. My name's Val. Um, I've been in Cambridge for 30 years, so I'm at the end of my career rather than at the, at the beginning. Um, I came from a modest background. Um, my father was a footballer and my mother uh, had to leave school at 16 because her parents told her so uh, and she worked in a bank. Um, I have one brother and both of us went to university, so we, uh, presumably one of them had, had something in, in their genes. Um, I then went to a, a grammar school, North Girls Grammar School in, in Grantham in Lincolnshire. So another a famous scientist uh, comes from Grantham and another <laughs> ex-MP comes from Grantham as well, the same school. Um, so I have a lot of common in uh, science and, and physics, in particular with Newton uh, and uh, Grantham. Uh, I then went to, I escaped Grantham and went to Sheffield and, and went to Oxford as well to do my doctorate. And then I became a postdoc uh, for quite some time at CERN uh, in Geneva. And that's where I, I do the majority of my research today. I came to Cambridge 30 years ago as a two-body problem. And, um, and I had a, an offer of a permanent job actually in the US at Chicago, but I decided to come to Cambridge because I liked the culture in this country. And um, the foresight of the head of the research group at the time, who was a woman, I have to say, she gave me some money to say, and she said, here's six months money, try and establish yourself. And that gave me the breathing space um, to apply for fellowships, you know, with research councils and, and colleges and so, and so on, and I managed to get two of them. And that meant that I was then in Cambridge. And I think that was a very good foresight on her part to is actually to give a breathing space to the two-body problem. Um, then at some point uh, in the, the, that period, um, a lectureship came up in, in the Cavendish Laboratory in total open competition. So it was open to any area of physics. And I remember applying to this thing, and I was told I was the only woman applicant, and there were 60 other men who had applied. Um, and I was also told from a, a colleague that not to bother applying because I wouldn't get the job. Um, as it happened, I applied and I, I got the job. Um, so I then became um, the third lecturer uh, in the Cavendish, third woman lecturer in the Cavendish, of course, Athene is the first. Um, and uh, I became a fellow at Trinity College uh, in Cambridge as well. Um, that was an interesting experience because out of 150 fellows in Trinity, there were four women. Um, and I'm now the senior woman there because the other three have passed away. And I remember uh, arriving at the college and sitting there at lunchtime uh, talking to an elderly fellow. And he said, oh, do you play cricket? <laughs> and um, I sort of thought to myself, well, I don't play cricket, but I wouldn't mind having a go. And then he turned around to me and said, oh, you can't. You're a woman. Uh, can you make sandwiches? <laughs> so I declined the offer, of course, um, but things have changed, right? We now, I don't know how many women we have in, in Trinity now, and I think that's a good thing. And also, I can't tell you how many women we have in the Cavendish, because that's a good thing. There are a huge number of uh, women lecturers, well, assistant professors, uh, the equivalents of readers and professors now. Um, and I think we've come a long way from when I was at university, which was 10%, of women, um, we've come, well, it's 25%, but also we're getting there at the higher levels as well. Anyway, what I do now is I, um, I just recently gave in uh, <laughs> heading the High Energy Physics Research Group in Cambridge. Um, I also uh, lead the Quantum Technology for Fundamental Physics program in Cambridge and chair a strategic research in initiative in quantum and advanced materials uh, for a sustainable society. Um, and in my spare time, I do a lot of championing of women in science and recently um, gave up once again being the university gender equality champion where I had the ear of the v VC on all issues to do with gender equality in, in the university. And finally, I have two daughters who I'm very proud of 
uh, but they didn't read physics. Um, one did bioanthropology in Cambridge, and the other on, is studying Russian, and she's on a year abroad at the moment in, in the moment at Kyrgyzstan. So that's me. <laughs> Great, thanks, Val. And let's go to Jess next. Okay, I've achieved far less. <laughs> I'll, I'll caveat that. Um, I'm, I'm Jess. I'm a research fellow, and also I just started as a lecturer at Imperial on the 1st of October. Um, actually, in it, yeah, great. <laughs> um, um, in, in the Department of Materials, which is in engineering. I actually, after um, school, I went to art school for a year. I went to Chelsea. I lived in Florence and did history of art and Italian before starting studying physics. And then um, did physics for an undergrad and a PhD. Temporarily moved into chemistry, the dark side, and then found my, my natural home in, in materials, which is really, really fantastic, actually. Um, um, I was just saying to Hayatan just before we started the fantastic tour from Chi, um, that the materials is incredibly diverse, you know, diverse in all senses. It's much more gender diverse than a physics department. It's much more ethnically diverse. And you have really diverse directions that these students want to go to. They're incredibly ambitious and societal focused in the types of things they want to apply their physics knowledge to, which is really refreshing to be around and something you can take back into a physics department and think, this is how we could restructure this course or do it slightly differently. I started thinking a lot about um, diversity and equality probably during my undergrad. It's quite something to go from an art degree to a physics undergrad and, <laughs> and suddenly um, be surrounded by, um, you know, a place like Cambridge or Imperial, not only um, a lot of men, but incredibly ambitious men who are, who are there to, to make, or who feel like they're there to make you feel inadequate and make you feel that thing like you can't get that lectureship because you're the only woman going for it or like you won't perform as well in an exam or you won't do as well doing a presentation. And so I started doing some things as an undergrad, kind of going to schools and, and, and quickly recognized that that was um, very rewarding. It felt really nice to stand on stage and talk about physics. Um, it does a lot for your confidence and probably makes you a much better public speaker. But actually, the kind of long term, we had that question about STEM ambassadors before, the actual impact of that kind of thing, um, incredibly hard to measure. And maybe you change the mind of someone who's on the fence about doing physics or engineering. But there's an awful lot of young people in those classrooms who'll just see you as a nice distraction from the lesson they didn't really want to have anyway. Um, so I started thinking about how we could do this a bit more sustainably and a bit more impactfully. I started working a lot with kind of networks of teachers. You know, if you speak to a room of physics teacher, did she leave something really important? She's got her phone. Whoa, <laughs> oh, so many secrets in that phone. Um, um, <laughs> if, 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 you, if you speak to a room of physics teachers, then the kind of multiplier effect is absolutely massive because they go and speak to all their classrooms afterwards. And I remember going to something that the Institute of Physics were organizing to train non-specialist physics teachers in how to teach physics. So, so teachers in, in schools who are teaching physics who've never done an A-level in physics, which is the majority of people teaching physics in UK schools. And there was one teacher at lunchtime, and, and she said, I just don't want the students to hate physics as much as I do. And I was like, oh, oh no. And, and I think that's really part of this huge problem, right? So we spoke, we, we asked a lot of questions there and a lot of very good and important questions about what Labour would do to try and move some of these statistics. I don't think it's really up to universities. I think so much of it starts at school. Mm -hmm. And actually, unless you properly pay teachers across all disciplines and really think about how you support physics teachers, none of this will ever change. So, so I really started thinking about teachers and also parents. I think parents are really key influences in young people's decision making. And so when I started organizing more things for young people when I was a PhD student, it would always involve teachers and parents, kind of getting parents to come in to see what their daughters or maybe sons were actually doing. Um, and, and, and some of those things are incredibly rewarding and great. Since becoming a lecturer, and I, I could talk at length about all of these things, but <laughs> since becoming a lecturer or since becoming a research fellow and having a little bit more power in that kind of organizing sense that we just heard was very critical in, in the earlier talk, um, I've started thinking a lot more about what we can do to support early career researchers and particularly how you can kind of level up, <laughs> a lot of government speech coming in here, but how you can level up the support we get in universities like Cambridge and Imperial. We get a phenomenal amount of support to apply for fellowships or to apply for lectureships or to give a really good interview or to prepare something for a funding proposal. And what you see when you look around the country is that that support's incredibly unequal. Um, I managed to, on about the third try, get the L'Oreal Women in Science Fellowship. And um, I tweeted 
before Twitter became the horrible dark place it is today. I tweeted and said if anyone wanted help in applying, I'd be happy to have a chat with them. And I ended up having about 60 phone calls in one week with the most remarkable women from around the UK. Um, and they all had sensational science ideas. Very few had the confidence to apply for this, even though it's not a huge amount of money. Um, but absolutely none of them, unless they were at Oxford, Cambridge or Imperial, had support within their institutions to help them write this kind of thing, or even thought that their postdoc supervisor would let them go for something that was their own personal award and not something that was going direct to um, directly benefit the postdoc supervisor. Um, so I started thinking a lot more about what we can do there to give people the skills that we have access to that they don't. I arranged two great things last summer, one for women in nanoscience and one for black physicists and engineers that were kind of for PhDs and postdocs to, to get these critical skills. And they were so incredibly rewarding, you know, smallish groups, kind of 30 or 40 people, but giving people financial support to get there and to be able to cover travel and caring responsibilities and stuff. Um, but also just these key skills and those opportunities to enter networks and spaces that we have the chance to. So that's something that I think has been really, really rewarding. And then, and then also kind of, um, Thinking about how we write these really big proposals, Val mentioned two quantum initiatives there. I, I asked the question about the quantum strategy. Um, this has got huge amounts of money behind these types of things now. You know, absolutely, well, some promised money and some real money. Um, <laughs> and the new CDT call that just came out that lots of people in this room probably applied for. We have real opportunity there to really think about diversity and equity from the outset and really properly. And I think we have a chance now as early career people or as people who genuinely care about this, who are on the teams who are organizing these kind of responses to these calls to embed proper ideas of equity and inclusion, not just collecting data, um, but doing meaningful things to try and build a more inclusive and equal kind of scientific community. And that's where I've, I've found real kind of strength and opportunity lately that you can go in and you can write this into a funding proposal. And then if X professor gets the money, they actually have to do it, right? Because you've told the funding council you're going to. Um, and, so, and so I'm putting a lot of energy there in the last few weeks. So I look forward to this panel. Yeah, I think there are lots of ideas already we're going to come back to. Um, let's go to Rebecca. Blimey. Um, <laughs> I ha I've actually prepared three lines to say, so I should fl <laughs> flesh it out a little bit. So, um, so um, I was born locally. I went to a girls' school, and uh, I've only really come to appreciate the value of that in later life. And I certainly don't think I'd be a, a scientist today if I hadn't started off in that environment. I think I'd been much more uh, doubtful of my abilities and... Um, I never, so I've never had the sense that there is something that a, a woman can't do, and I think that has come entirely from the fact that I went to a girls' school. I've often had the sense that I can't do it, but it's not because I'm a woman that I can't do it. Um, so from, from school, I went to Oxford to read zoology. I should say I'm a zoologist. I'm an evolutionary biologist. Um, and I, I did that because I was just excited about it. I wanted to find out more about it. And when I left Oxford, I came to Cambridge to do a PhD for exactly the same reason. I couldn't but uh, imagine my life not doing zoology of some kind. And so my career has been constructed by opportunities to carry on doing the kinds of things I love. Uh, and so I've just followed my nose from one step to the next and continued uh, in different flavors of evolutionary biology. Uh, I, I managed to engineer about 10 years of my life gadding about the world, doing field work in nice places uh, to study social lives of other animals. And then I was lucky enough to get a, a job here in Cambridge uh, in 2005 when I was appointed as a lecturer in the Department of Zoology. And I, uh, it was only really at that point that I started to notice there weren't that many women around. And uh, so I think, and so the department has existed for 157 years, and I was the sixth lecturer in the department. Uh, and then shortly after that, the other two women in the department retired, and one of them died. And so then there was one. <laughs> And at that point, I became very interested in uh, the lack of diversity in science. And so I initiated the Athena Swan uh, application from our department, uh, ahead of the game, actually, in the School of Biological Sciences, uh, mainly out of, entirely out of selfish interest, <laughs> because I quite fancied the idea of having female colleagues in the department. Um, I had, there were plenty of women in the professional services staff who were very supportive, but not so many women in the... Um, academic staff, although I was very lucky to have incredibly supportive uh, male colleagues. And uh, again, I don't think I would have had the career I've had if I hadn't had them in the building with me. 
Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I just carried on progressing from one step to the next. And uh, in 2019, I ended up becoming the director of the Museum of Zoology, which was a fantastically exciting, unexpected moment. I never thought that would be something I would do. And it opened doors to be able to talk more broadly about the importance of um, diversifying science and making science accessible to everyone because that's what museums do. We're a house of stories. We can tell stories about our collections in new ways to inspire people to come and see the collections and to learn about ways in which they can be explored to um, understand the big scientific problems of our time, things like the biodiversity crisis, the extinction crisis. But there are stories wrapped up in our collections that help convey that message to a very broad audience. And so we spend a lot of our efforts uh, channeling, channeling work towards schools and to communities that wouldn't ordinarily have anything to do with science or with the University of Cambridge, because we are the open door through which they can come and learn about these big problems and the solutions that we're trying to find here in Cambridge to solve them. So that's the last four years. And then 26 days ago, I became the head of the zoology department. <laughs> uh, so I'm still slightly reeling from that. And that's a really exciting opportunity, because for 30 years since I arrived in the department as a PhD student, I've been watching from the sidelines, and I have a very long list of things I've been wanting to do that entire time to change uh, the way things were. And now, finally, I hope I have at least some opportunities to change things for the better. And one thing that I'm really passionate about, and one thing that I think I've benefited from enormously from my time in the zoology department, is the value of community in driving change. And I think Chi referenced this a few times in her talk, and I, I completely agree with, with this, that we can't do anything single-handedly. We can only make, bring change, men and women, by working together. And this is the kind of culture that I want to install in the department now, to, to make it everyone's agenda to change, because everyone will benefit from it. We all flourish in communities that work well for everyone. We're all better when we're surrounded by inspirational people who share their ideas with us and who are collegiate and collaborative. And this is very much the kind of atmosphere that I want to instill in the Department of Zoology now. So we all become the best version of ourselves. And that seems to be the only way, the most effective way that I can help deliver the university's mission more broadly. Great. Thanks a lot. So um, I now have the daunting task of guiding us through a discussion in about 20 minutes <laughs> on a very long list of things that I think we would like to discuss before opening the floor for questions. Um, so I think uh, Chi set the platform very nicely in her previous talk about what, um, what we all have to gain from diversifying science. Um, but actually, we also, as we've already heard, um, hear a lot about the underrepresentation of women in undergraduate courses around the UK. Um, so, you know, if you take the numbers in Cambridge, we're looking at, you know, under 20% in computer science, around 25% in maths and engineering. Um, science is a bit more complicated, and I think we were discussing this before, and we'll come back to that later on. Um, but, you know, one of the challenges we have is the pipeline. So, you know, actually um, is at the point of application to university, are, are, are things already set in motion? And I wonder if anyone here wanted to give their um, kind of opinions on actually what's going on before that and why things are so skewed um, at the school level. Um, and I think I'll go to Jess. Okay. Although I feel like we should bring in our sick former. Is Amy, was it Amy? Um, I feel like Amy might also have something to add on this because you are actually at school. <laughs> I'll make what I'll make a few um, comments just from the Institute of Physics. The Institute of Physics have done so many reports on this and have really looked at it for about the past 30 years, the reasons why certain demographic groups opt out of physics. And if you haven't looked at those reports, there's a few. In particular, Opening Doors is a really fantastic one that kind of sets out what schools can do to become more gender inclusive, but actually build more equal and fair spaces. Coming back to your point that if it kind of works for women, you make a more fair society or department for everyone. And, and what they looked at particularly was something Amy mentioned about, about stereotypes and also that sense of belonging you have. It's something we've looked at a lot in the physics undergrad program at Imperial, but really students' sense of belonging and how that impacts their academic attainment and also their likelihood to stay in physics afterwards. If you're in a space where perhaps you're taught by people who look like you, but at least they encourage you and they're really fantastic teachers. You know, some, sometimes people talk about the gender of the teacher being important, but that's been shown to be largely irrelevant if the teacher is really, really great. 
and um, but really encouraging you and not making it in any way an idea that men outperform women in any of these subjects because the instant you start doing that you cause people from certain demographic groups to get anxious and feel like they're not going to do as well and if you constantly feel like that when it comes to something high pressure like an exam you, you don't perform as well and so i think sense of belonging community eliminating stereotypes having someone who's going to be senior and champion it she said um, you know Keir Starmer taking this very sim seriously she taking it very seriously also having someone in a school or a university who's going to take this seriously they obviously don't have initiatives like Athena Swan at schools and no one wants to give teachers more administrative things to take on but but getting them to become champions of this and to eliminate even casually sexist or racist language even you know all those comments, and I'm sure you discussed it earlier when you were discussing maths, but those comments about maths being a boy's subject and things like that. So I think, I think trying to eliminate that um, would be a good step in the direction. But as I mentioned um, in my little very not short opening piece, um, we really need to improve the quality and the support we give to physics, computer science and maths teachers. Because if we don't have good teachers there, it will be very hard to change who's choosing to study those subjects. But maybe, Amy, if there was any extra remarks from Amy about the school environment, sorry to make you do extra work, microphone masters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I agree that confidence is a big issue at the moment. So maths, generally, there's a lot more confidence, but physics especially, in my class, uh, uh, in year 12, so first year of A-levels, we're about a class of 25 and there are about five girls. This is completely different from, for instance, maths, where there's a lot more confidence. But even at the start of the year, we had a few more girls and they left because it's such an overwhelming environment where it's almost entirely boys. And, as, and especially within a school environment, a lot of them know each other. So you're sort of excluded from that, and therefore the pressure of being one of the few girls, even if there are other girls, you feel excluded. It's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. You go into it, it's, never, it's an overwhelming environment because there aren't any other, uh, any other girls, rather, and therefore you leave, but that means there aren't any other girls. So new people coming in, it's the same issue over and over again. Um, yeah, it's... And computer science, again, it's confidence. Um, in year 10, my computer science teacher did a really interesting experiment. He had the entire class that was about 50-50 girls and boys stand in a line of how confident you felt. And it was an absolute split. It wasn't even a gradient. It was a complete split with girls always being less confident, even if they were getting grades much higher than boys who were more confident. So I feel one of the biggest issues is confidence in girls. How do we increase confidence in a subject where even subconsciously, teachers from reception are drawing us away from a subject. Yeah, that's fantastic point, Amy. Thank you so much. Um, but I, I, I do think that sense of confidence, that sense of trust in your teacher, um, and that sense of belonging in a classroom is really, really important. And also getting the boys to realise that it's something that will really benefit them long term. Having equal, you know, not just gender diversity, but diversity in all its forms amongst all of these technical subjects will create better innovations for tomorrow. And I think they probably would realize it in five to 10 years, but it's very hard when you're a teenager to get them to realize that. But yeah, I could talk at this about, about this for ages. Well, we've, we've got a lot of bases to go through. Um, I see there's a hand raise. Is this one more last point on the schools discussion and then we'll move on? I'm not sure if I'm allowed to. Yeah, no, no, no. We, you, you, Do it. Just, we're, we're aiming at you lot. Sorry, so. I know you've got a time limit, but just quickly, Amy, you made such a great point about the confidence as well. And I'd like to share um, an experience of my friend. I go to um, an all girls school and one of my friends moved to a different sixth form, which was a school with all boys and a mixed sixth form. And she was the only girl in her class who did physics. And she promptly dropped out because of the environment and the teasing from the boys. And I'd also like to point out something that she said about social media and the impact um, of especially applications like TikTok. I obviously spend a lot of time on it, maybe a bit more than I should, <laughs> but I get a lot of videos um, of girls who do take physics and they, they are at university and they are studying, but they share their horrible experiences of even basic things like the smell of the lecture hall when you walk in. Now, I'm not saying all boys are stinky, <laughs> but, you know, um, there was a study done, and I 
can't remember the source, but um, girls performed better in a lecture hall where it was decorated as traditionally girly compared to one that was filthy and smelly. So. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so, and Val, did you want to...? Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to make a couple of points, actually. I mean, people focus on these percentages. Um, you know, 23% girls are women doing physics, 18% computer science in un coming into university. But that is just reflective of what they're doing at A-levels. And, you know, I don't know what the natural number is. You know, if you had ideal equality of opportunity, would it be 50%? And I don't think there's been any research done at this at any level. Well, not maybe at some level, but not in serious, serious level. And I'd really like to see... You know, if you had complete equal of equal equality of opportunity, equal access to all subjects, quality of teaching and so on, you know, the ideal school situation, would you really expect 50% in all subjects? I don't know. I know it's good to have targets and try and strive for more because it seems to be extremely low, but I don't know what the natural level is. And the other couple of points I want to make is that school, compared to my own experience, <coughs> Um, students seem to be career driven now. Right? I talk to my own children and they think from a very early age, what am I going to do? What's my career? What subjects do I need in order to do that career? Whether I want to be a scientist or whether I want to be a lawyer or a, a medic or something, they're very career driven. And I think we have to address this career you know, intensity and just show them that you know, doing your best, fulfilling your potential, you have a broad set of opportunities. And also it's about educating parents about all the broad opportunities in science. It's not just if you're very good at physics, maths and biology, you can become a medic, right? It's more than that. Yeah. And I yeah. think we really need to expose all of the career opportunities within to the parents, to the, the kids in, in the school setting. And finally, <laughs> on the choice of subjects as well, there's a big study done on what girls do, what choice of subjects girls do. They're likely to do physics, so we've got the 20% doing physics, but they're less likely to do the computer science, the further maths, the engineering that comes with physics to give you this overall package that means that you then go on to university and become a... You've got all the basic building blocks to do the science that you want to do. And I think we need to look at that more as well, about the the uh, technical skills, the problem-solving skills that we teach in schools in order to prepare for university. Yeah, I think there's um, a, a mounting um, list of things that I hope other people from me are writing down. So uh, also, thanks to those of you who have already raised the really important points about confidence, because I think that's something that many of us at many different levels experience and actually um, having better bystanders around you, whether that be your teachers, whether that be your classmates, that can kind of help and support you get through that is really important. Um, so let's, let's get to the point of arriving at university. Um, and actually, one thing that's also often said is the idea that the fact there are so few, in some cases, female academics, um, mean that actually people are much more likely to be taught by um, men than women. Um, anecdotally, I can verify that because I think... I'm the only woman doing an extended lecture course in first year physics here this year. Um, but I wonder if um, anyone could comment on what we think actually the impact of this is on, you know, male dominated teaching at university. Um, and I might go to Val and then I might go to Rebecca because so, I know it's very different in the biological so it, sciences. It sounds like you took over my lecture course. I did. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I used to give the, the first lecture course the physicists get in their first year. So you have 150, maybe more than that. No, actually 400, 400 students in a lecture theatre, the biggest lecture theatre in, in Cambridge. And you've just got this mass of many male faces with the, the few women um, uh, in it as well. And I'm glad that Sarah's taken on, but it is a big effort. And we heard earlier uh, today how, what a big effort it is if you do a first year course, because you've got a huge number of students to deal with. Thankfully, in Cambridge, we have the supervision system, which picks up any questions. And I think, I think role models have some effect. I'm not sure it's the whole answer. I think the quality of lecturing and the quality of supervision teaching is more important. You can have a very good woman or a very good man supervising tutorials, um, 
they've got to be patient, they've got to have the time, and this is one of the problems with academia, is the time to really understand the issues that the students have, understanding the, the material that they've been given. Um, and, you know, this college, before you came, had a very good... Uh, you, you know, you're very good as well, but... <laughs> <laughs> but they had a very good, you know, traditional white man, Owen, who was a brilliant um, actual supervisor and who really helped the, the women in the college reach their potential. So I don't think it's just a question of role model. It's really the quality that matters. So I, I'm going to hand over to Rebecca here because I would, A, like to hear your thoughts that you, you've already said a bit about the differences between the biological sciences and the physical sciences, but also anything else you wanted to add about uh, teaching. OK, so, well, I'll start with the similarity, which is, so I'm the only woman teaching the second year evolutionary biology course and the third year evolutionary biology course. So it's not, that's a very, that, there is, there's parity there. The big difference is that about 60% of the people I teach are women. And that stays, it drops to about 50% at PhD level. But so there, there is a leaky pipeline, but it leaks much later. So I think some of the issues that you guys are talking about on the physical side of um, the sciences perhaps don't apply as strongly till later on in the biological sciences. And, the, um, and, I, and I agree with what Val said, actually, about the quality of teaching being key rather than the, the gender of the person who's delivering the lectures. Um, so that's, yeah, that's the, the, the key thing to say there. I think I did have something I wanted to say about the style of teaching and the style of examining. Um, so I think, I think supervisions are, they're great. It's a, good, it's a good thing generally, but they're also quite terrifying for students, especially in their first year. Um, and I think that men and women respond to that terror on average in different ways. Uh, and this is my experience as being a supervisor, and anecdotally, I haven't collected data on this. Um, which is that the average man responds to being terrified by becoming extremely cocky and vocal, and the average woman <laughs> responds by being extremely quiet and hiding in the corner, and then thinking, oh, my God, I'm even worse than I thought, because look how confident he is. So um, I, I don't think we should abolish supervisions, but I think it might be an idea to think about, at least for the very first term, splitting them by gender, so that, that you don't exaggerate those differences in confidence, which we've already heard about are there at school and perhaps made even worse by the supervision system on, on arriving in Cambridge and, and we, could, we could think more carefully about that. And then the second thing I think we should think about is the way that we examine and I haven't got any data on this but um, so in zoology we have, we have never had a problem with women getting fewer firsts than men. The, it's about the same uh, year on year. I think this year we actually had slightly more firsts going to women. Um, but uh, I, th I think the style of examining uh, is, and the way that you perform and the different ways that we examine people, it, it could be influential here. And I haven't analysed that in any depth. But a big chunk of our third year mark goes on project work. I would like to know if women perform better than men on that. I suspect they do. And, and I, I bet the converse is true for the theory papers. which are. Um, but I think we've got the opportunity from the COVID years to look at that in more detail because we went to open book for three years. And I'd be interested to know whether that has closed any gender gap that might have existed. Um, because it, as I found them more interesting to read, and I think they drew out uh, a better range of answers from our students. And I'd be interested to know whether there are any gender effects that have crept in, in there. Can I ask one question? Um, the difference you think exists in first year supervisions, is it the same between men and women as between privately and state educated people? Because I haven't collected those data. Because I imagine you're taught for that kind of thing if you go to a private school. Well, so I, I, all I can talk about is my own experience, and I, I found that from ter terrifying as a first year student in Oxford. So I don't, I don't necessarily think that, I think it all, it's a lot to do with the individual. I can see why coming through a private education might help with your confidence levels, but I think that's not the only, only part of it. Yeah. I, I'm just hesitant, all of these things, to say it's anything to do with um, anything other than societal conditioning. And I think, I think a lot I, of it is to do with, I, I don't know. I'm not yeah. disagreeing with you. I think the societal conditionings acted differently on men, men and women. Yeah. I think um, if I can give one anecdotal point here, because um, we've been thinking about study skills with some of our early career students, and I think um, confidence is one of the things that, you know, you can attribute where that confidence might come from, from the educational background, the gender, or if you identify with another um, underrepresented group. But I think... Um, I have noticed, um, because many of our students in Murray Edwards um, have supervisions along with other women when they start here, 
I find that you see their confidence grow much more in the early years than, for example, I did when I witnessed um, female students in a mixed group in, in other colleges. So I think, I think catching it early and, you know, maybe ironing out some of the, the differences you might have from your educational background, you know, I, I think um, some people are more confident to speak up. Um, and yeah, I, I think it can make a difference, but there are also other things that- No, I mean, it, it definitely does. In, like everyone <laughs> saying the type of school they went to on the panel before, that Institute of Physics data shows that you're two and a half times more likely to study physics if you go to an all girls school than if you go to a mixed school. So obviously there's huge influence. Um, it's just when we stop saying, okay, we're gonna keep perpetuating that difference rather than saying yeah. we've got to also work on the fact that society should be 50-50. We shouldn't have to separate people to make it more equal and fair. Um, and the longer we keep doing that, um, the further we're embedding those issues. I haven't really articulated it, but that's kind of where my thinking's at at the moment. I've heard that a diamond model of education is the best way that you teach people in mixed schools until secondary school, you separate them and have girls and boys and bring them back together in sick form because boys see how well girls perform at sick form and actually step up and girls perform very, very well at sick form. But that's obviously very logistically difficult to coordinate on a national level. But I do think it's really challenging to think if we know we've got to do this work to improve confidence. I, I, yeah, I don't know how you solve it, but I, I don't want to keep making it more of a problem would be my response. But, but I think that's why the community building aspect mm. of the environment in which you work is so important because that, that is another way to level, level the playing field. It doesn't allow the more confident person to thrive at the expense of everyone else if everyone is pulling together and working together and supporting the less mm. confident individuals. So there's many ways that you can tackle confidence. You don't have to do it by segregating people alone. Yeah. There are, there are, it, it will take multiple things to fix the problem. But uh, we've only hit on two of them so far. <laughs> Um, can I actually just come back to the point you said about the you feel the pipeline being a bit later? Are, have you reflected on what you think the biggest drivers of the, the later pipeline problems are? Uh, um, yes. <laughs> and we so, share them with us. Yes, OK. <laughs> so, um, so the biggest drop uh, in uh, biological sciences tends to happen from the kind of second postdoc onwards to the point of becoming a permanent academic. And uh, so at that point, people are approximately 30 plus. So there are a few biological drivers there that might be pulling people away from thinking about a career in science. If you're working in a lab that's uh, where the culture is to be very present, to be doing lab experiments 15 hours a day, and you're also wondering, how am I, how am I gonna sustain this ever if I ever want to have a family? You can see in, very easily how that's not gonna add up fast. Um, and and I, the other thing is, I think that there's a um, the lack of there. There is a role model for how to be a scientist, which is quite toxic. Which is that you are a lone genius, that you lead from the front, that everyone follows behind, uh, and that you know by sheer power of intellect you will solve every problem, and all your underlings will follow in your thrall behind you. Which is just completely inaccurate and not how science works. It's a much bigger effort. It's a team effort. Uh, and that is an appealing model for women that's not put out there enough. And I think if, 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 that, if that was a, a way of working that was uh, instilled in women that are at the earliest stages of, the, of their careers as new postdocs, I think it would be seen as a more attractive long-term option. Yeah, so again, some of it is still linked to this image of what a scientist yeah. is and what it will be like for your career. And Val, do you want to come in? Yeah, I mean, just on this postdoc, I mean, it's clearly it's the same in, in physics that, you know, you get... Um, attrition as the, you go through the postdoc years. Um, and there's actually a paper in Nature today um, saying that um, long-term postdocs are just really wiping a lot of people out. They just, you know, cannot have, they cannot settle, they cannot mm. have families, yeah. they can't get academic posts, and they've just got this long-term hell, basically, of, of um, short-term um, positions. I'm not sure how we can fix it, but I think we have to deal with reality and, and really help our postdocs to know that maybe not all of them are going to become academics, not all of them are going to get those permanent academic positions, and just help them transition with, to other um, roles, other um, areas of, of research in industry or something like that, and make sure that they don't feel they're failures mm. if they mm. do that. Because it's been for a long time, 
people have thought, I'm a failure if I don't get that permanent position in academia. And actually, it's not that great having a permanent <laughs> position in academia. <laughs> it's hard work. <laughs> you know, so you can succeed very well um, in, other, in other roles. And the other thing I'd like to say is that I'm very proud to say that over the last few years, I really changed the whole of the recruitment process in this university. And I remember when I started it, um, the, I was just told that the statutes are too big, and that thick, we can't change the recruitment process. So I said, yes, we can. The statutes are now that thick. Um, <laughs> and it's really a question of searching, reaching out to everybody who may um, be able to uh, apply for uh, positions in the, in the university, both postdocs and in academia. Um, and make sure that all the women that you know about who could potentially get yeah. them apply, yeah. right? And really have those search committees. And if you don't, if you get shortlisted with no women on, you can stop the process and say, it's not good, let's start again, let's try again, because maybe the field is too narrow that, that we're looking in and so on. And I, I'm very proud that in the Cavendish, since we changed the recruitment process, I think probably we've, we've been uh, recruiting 50% women ever since. Wow. You know, and I think you can do it if you really think about the process and and mm. and um, and search for search for the right people to apply. Um, Jess, I was actually wondering because you've obviously been in a few different departments within the same institute. Do you, would you give a quick comment on, I guess, any comparison? The culture, to firm? culture is hugely different if you go out of physics. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, if you go into other departments, I'd say. Um, it's a lot more supportive. <laughs> um, um, people generally want to, you to um, succeed in a slightly different way in smaller departments. I think there's more time focused on supporting individual fellows. Some departments that you go into, there'll be hundreds of fellows, maybe more than 100 academics. They're not going to support individual ones. And I think there's a culture, certainly at Oxford, Cambridge and Imperial, um, that you're lucky to be there because it's Oxford and Cambridge and Imperial. So they won't give you much support for applying for a fellowship like a Royal Society fellowship or a FLF fellowship or things like that. FLF fellowship is like pin number, isn't it? An FLF or something like that. Um, so they don't give you a huge amount of support to, supply, um, to apply. And that actually also impacts your likelihood to get it with the funding councils because they don't take very favorably to the lack of support you get from your institution. But I do think there's that mismatch. There's, you know, if you go into a smaller department, they'll be looking out for you a bit more. Um, and therefore, you're probably more likely to see, succeed earlier on. You may not have that academic network around you um, to constantly inspire new ideas in the way that you would do in Imperial, Cambridge, Oxford type universities. But it will be very different the types of support you'll get. Um, so obviously, is a huge cultural thing. Um, something that just strikes me so much. I've had this um, project for the last few years where I've been writing the Wikipedia pages of women scientists. And so I spend my evenings researching women scientists and writing their biographies for Wikipedia. And so much of your likelihood to succeed in science is based on that luck of where you do your PhD and where you go after your PhD for your postdoc. And it can't all be a predetermined thing that at the age of 15, you know you want to work on this particular part of cell biology so you know where to apply. It's whose lab you walk into, how successful you are maybe in those first few years of PhD. If, you're put on, if your name's put on a few papers that are successful and open your door to your next stage. Um, and I think in academia, people like to sit around and think, oh, I got here because I'm such a genius. Or like, you know, I'm just so clever. And you like look at your like, nice office or whatever, and you think like, oh, I've made it. Um, but actually, it's, it's so much about luck. And, and I think we need to reflect that more and, and, and rec t tell, do you know, Physics is a hugely privileged subject to be able to get into. If we've acknowledged that you're probably more likely to go to an all-girls school, that's already a barrier. Um, you've got to have a really great teacher. You've probably got parents who've supported you to go into a subject that may not necessarily have a career prospect at the end of it that's very transparent to them. And so, so much of it is about privilege. And I think if we start reflecting that a bit more, it changes the culture yeah. um, because you start to think, I'm really lucky to be here. It's a great thing to be able to do. And it's just a really fun job. Um, and so, and yeah, I just, I think we need to do a bit more of that and a less of the, you know, high and mighty stuff. Yeah, totally agree. It's brilliant. Yeah. So I think now is definitely the time to open the floor for um, some questions or comments um, from those in the room. And um, please raise your hand and we'll run mics around. There are so many. And also please give your name um, and where you're from if you're comfortable doing that. Okay. Um, so hi, I'm Holly. I'm a PhD student here at Murray Edwards. 
Um, before that, I was also an undergraduate at Cambridge, and I wanted to come back around to um, the, it's probably going to be quite controversial, but the um, gender splitting supervisions. So having both been an undergraduate attending supervisions and also now as a PhD student giving supervisions, um, I remembered in my first year, actually the fact that a lot of, so I am coming from a privately educated background, I'm so there's a place of privilege I'm coming from there, but a lot of the um, young men I was in supervisions with who were very cocky actually boosted my confidence because they were very cocky and wrong. <laughs> 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 and, and I could tell that and I could see that very immediately. Um, I like it. <laughs> so I, don't, I think I see the point of gender splitting supervisions and as someone in a teaching position, I've definitely had some female students who would have benefited from gender split supervisions. But I think doing that across the board, yeah. rather than on a case by case basis, might harm more than it helps. Uh, yeah. could, could you comment on that maybe? I, I think that's a very reasonable point. And uh, in a similar vein, I, I'd like to say that I've benefited enormously by some of the poorer quality male colleagues that have surrounded me for the same reasons if you've, <laughs> as you've enjoyed. Um, uh, being alongside cocky wrong men. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, that's a, it's, um, obviously we should be sensitive to the needs of each individual student and not just apply a broad brush approach. But I don't think uh, even thinking about it as a broad brush approach is, has been on the table. So uh, it was a, a crude first step rather than a refined strategy that I was advocating. But it's like the constant conversation around getting girls into physics at A-level. If you look at the kind of gender split of who does A-level, you can download it from the JCQ website. And every year it's like, Girls are doing loads of Welsh as a first language, Welsh as a second language, psychology, drama. There's no campaign to get more boys into psychology and drama. <laughs> so it's like you do need an equal balance, I think, in the, the approach to it. And actually helping boys be able to talk more and talk more about their feelings and maybe take on some of these girly traits um, is, would be massively beneficial for society as well. Um, so um, if we could keep hands being raised so we can run the mics around, there are lots. So I think there was one up here quite early. There's one at the back already. Oh, hello. Um, I'm Karina. I did science like five years ago at Cambridge as a postgrad. Um, but I, I wanted to ask, do you think ability will prevail or do you think um, all these barriers will eventually stifle talent? And I just wanted to say that it has been a problem for me with cocky men um, in, in undergraduate situations. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to get your reflections really on, on that, please, thank you. Sal, do you I, wanna say something to that? I hope we have between us enough experience to pick out the cocky men right, and challenge them. Um, I think, I mean, ability has to, has to prevail. Um, otherwise, we, we're, we're failing everybody, actually. Um, I mean, one thing that um, we haven't really touched on is the harassment side of things. And I, you know, I talk to a lot of women in the university, undergraduates, postgraduates, postdocs, and there's still a lot of harassment and bullying going on. And I think, and it's, it's played down, it's kept quiet. Um, even though we try and put processes in place um, to, to enable people to speak out, um, there's still a lot going on. And, I'm very concerned about making sure that everybody has somewhere they can go to and express their their um, their experience, um, including you know the the cocky male. But the cocky male it can be a harassment, you know, just being cocky and and talking over you and so on. That's a, a form of harassment. It's not sexual harassment, but it's a form of harassment, and you, we need to stamp on that. So I think there's um, one can we, there. Can we, one just, can we add t one tiny yeah, thing? Yeah, please do. I think if you look at society, though, ability hasn't really prevailed. If you look at who's leading the like world's biggest tech companies or who's in <laughs> government, I don't think it's a case where ability has prevailed. So I think you do need to keep the pressure on a little bit. And we can say in universities, we'll do the absolute best we can to support students who want to go to particular career paths or support them to follow their dreams and give them the best training they can, irrespective of their background or gender or ethnicity or whatever. Um, but, but I don't think if you looked at society now as a whole, you could say it's ability that's prevailed and who's successful. So we, you do have to keep monitoring it and checking it. Um, so there's definitely got us one in the corner over there. And then there's one down here. 
And then if people could keep their, and then there's a few in that corner too. So maybe if you pass it back when you have it. <laughs> uh, I'm Susan Whitfield with a long, long career in, in school education. Two little points. One was the splitting for uh, GCSE. I know of a school which, with a brilliant young physics teacher, she suggested they split just the GCSE, just the key stage three uh, stage, uh, key stage four. So when they made their choices in year nine, they knew they were going into separate classes and they all had to take science and they all had to take maths, so they weren't choosing away from them. And the numbers, taking, the numbers of girls taking A-level physics shot up immediately and they were being taught together, obviously, at sixth form. And that continued for some years, and then the school, for timetabling reason, changed it, and another number dropped immediately. So that's one point. That's just one school. The second point is about failure and confidence. If small children are taught that failing is a good way of learning, then the confidence which goes along with being frightened of failing is much, much less. And I had a wonderful design technology teacher who came from the railways, and he had a big banner outside his uh, workshop, which was resistant materials, so it was sort of baby engineering lab. And it said, people who don't make mistakes don't make anything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's a very good point about resilience. I don't know. No, I pick up on that. I mean, I've had so many experience of children at schools ha being told that there's a right answer. Even my own children, you know, coming home with their maths homework, saying, you've got to help me find the right answer. And I could see it's totally ambiguous. And I couldn't give them the right answer. I tried to explain every way possible to say it's ambiguous. But they said, there is, yes. there is a method, and, and I've got to do it, the school method, and there's a right answer, because it's so exam-focused, I think. And I think the other thing that we, we really need to focus on a bit, science is an experimental subject. We, we need to teach the experimental method properly. And we don't do that, enough of that in schools, um, and we don't do enough of that in universities now to let the, the students have the time just to try things out, mm -hmm. experiment, and get it wrong, and something will blow, and you know, so what? But they've learned something. And, and being able to write up a practical that didn't work, I think is as good as writing up a practical that you've got exactly the right answer, that you look in a Constance book and find it. So I, I, I think we really have to you know, teach and, and the, the students how to do experiments and fail when necessary. Yeah. Um, there's one here. Yeah, Judith Perry. I came to Cambridge in 1984, having had a 10-year, 12-year uh, experience as a senior researcher in the Max Planck Institute in Germany as a postdoc. So I came in with, and had led a group and developed things. And when I got to uh, the Institute of Astronomy, Donald Lyndon Bell, who was the chairman of the department, said, we'll do everything we can for you. You're clearly a leading scientist in your field, but this university does not appoint women to jobs and the experience. And he knew that from you know, basically the, the women at that time were going, as Val described, from postdoc to postdoc to postdoc than otherwise, you know, teaching in, in uh, colleges. And I started supervising at King's, which was very interesting because a colleague of mine from Germany recommended me to, to King's as a potential supervisor. And the chap at King's who hired the supervisor said, oh, but she can't possibly because she's not Oxbridge. But uh, I was appointed nonetheless, and then apparently was one of the top people, and, and my students were doing very well. But what I noticed in, in 84 uh, and 85 was that I had women students at King's and male students at King's, and I was supervising mathematics and physics. And by Christmas, the women were sort of going down and very meek and slightly frightened, whereas the men were feeling really, you know, they were excited. It was the first year. It was fantastic. And I noticed and I spoke to the senior uh, fellow in, in the college uh, in physics and said, I'm concerned about the women and I'd like to invite the women home and, you know, support them. And he said, what a wonderful idea. Nobody's ever done that. Go to the 
go to the, um, <laughs> the wine steward and tell him to give you a few bottles of undergraduate quality plonk. Undergraduate quality. <laughs> <laughs> so you can entertain the women. And uh, that started, uh, it, it sort of grew within kings uh, as the women got together. And so I was, you know, what you were saying about the women losing confidence. And the women were just as good as the men, but they were, you, you could almost see it was like, a balloon that was, mm. uh, you know, a, a punctured. Uh, but I also wanted to address Val's very controversial uh, question <laughs> oh dear. about whether 50-50 would be the ideal. And very interestingly, to throw something in and don't, you know, take off, there is a sense in which, if you're interested in, you know, how people behave and things, there is a a slight sense that particularly amongst the mathematicians and the physicists, there seems to be a much higher incidence of Asperger syndrome type personalities amongst the men. Mm -hmm. And that, what you little you see of it, and it's not well enough studied, and I agree with Val, it should be studied, Asperger syndrome seems to be higher amongst men than amongst women. And so I wonder if there are aspects of the way that the sociology of the subject is conducted do work differently for men and for women and that that kind of focus and the problem solving whether some of that and it's something these are all questions because then you look at you know as i said before the quality difference between one country and another clearly the sociology is a very, very important part of it. And I think unless we start examining that culture, we won't really make the kind of changes that we'd like. I'll, I'll come in very, very quickly. Um, I'm the daughter of a psychiatrist as well. Um, and I think Asperger's and autism is massively underdiagnosed in women. So women learn to assimilate certain personality traits, which make them underdiagnosed if you go to get a diagnosis of that kind of thing. So it's very hard to say, oh yes, amongst the physics population, there are more people who are Asperger's or autistic, and that's because that's overrepresented in men. And therefore, I was once actually asked it on a podcast about Wikipedia editors and why if people who are autistic quite like editing Wikipedia, we should naturally expect there to be more male editors on Wikipedia. But luckily I knew it was because women were massively underdiagnosed for being autistic or Asperger's. So I think it's, it's way too difficult to say that maybe... We'd have to correct medical, we'd have to make healthcare much more equitable and diagnosis much more <laughs> equitable there to use it as a proxy. <laughs> so um, I'm quite keen for us to get round the hands that are still up in the room. I think there are a couple of points here and then some towards the back. Um, thanks everyone, these are all really great points and hopefully we can convene more over coffee as well. Yeah. Hi, I'm Amy, I'm a second year undergraduate here at Medford. And I just wanted to go back to the point about women having more confidence to speak up in supervision. Because I feel like I have the confidence to speak up in supervision, but still I get spoken over and interrupted regularly in one of my supervisions and in my labs by my lab partners. So should it not really be a conversation of, should men interrupt us less, rather yeah. than is all the time having more confidence in speaking over the best way to conduct science? Or maybe should we take the more feminine approach of actually actively listening to each other? Okay. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I no think. response, we just all agree. We agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, if I'm allowed to add a quick comment, I know I'm the chair, but I think it shouldn't be the responsibility of people being interrupted to have to then, you know, basically fight fire with fire in order to be heard. Um, I think people teaching and also your colleagues around you being more aware that these are things that can happen yeah. even unconsciously is important. I don't know if anyone else wants yeah, to... That's why changing the culture is part of this. I mean, one thing that we have when you arrive at university is you have an induction, so you're told where, you know, where your key is, where your room is, you know, what time you have to turn up for lectures and all this sort of thing. But maybe we should just actually have a discussion about what good practice is mm. and what good practice in the laboratories, the supervisions is with every student in the university so that we can just raise the, raise the culture a little bit. So I think there was one next to the previous question then. There's one up in the corner and then one in the middle. Oh, 
Uh, yeah, we can pass it across quickly. Um, one of the things that was very interesting during the COVID period when we were all on Zoom and Teams meetings was that actually the cocky male behaviour was massively reduced by the tech. Muting so them. what it happened in meetings mm. that I was uh, involved <laughs> in and leading uh, quite often was that uh, you can just mute people. And so, <laughs> and so uh, and also, you don't, even need, you don't even need the chair or leader of the meeting to mute them. Um, the tech does it for, for yourself. So you just speak up and you carry on talking about what it is you're, you're talking about. <laughs> Nobody can talk over you because the tech is in charge. So I just want to mention that because you, you, you then get much more equitable discussions, decision making, uh, re more reflective and definitely more collaborative work when you're on, the, on a Zoom call than you do in often in real time. So just, mm, just a quick yeah. mention on that. No, thanks. For I've, I have had discussions with with colleagues, both in the university and, you know, in my research collaborations at CERN and so on. And the num number of pe men who said to me, oh, we really are keen to get back into the, into the meeting room. So we can basically, the behind it was dominate the discussions. <laughs> Whereas I was quite happy on Zoom because, you know, I could have a meeting and we could, and I could chair it effectively and I'd go to each person and they all had their say. And uh, it worked quite well. So, yes, I, I share your, uh, your observation there. Right, so let's take a question here. And then there's a few um, at the back. And then I think we're going to have to wrap up, I'm afraid. Uh, cool, yeah. Hi, I'm Evie. I'm also an undergraduate at Medwoods. Um, I wanted to circle back again to the confidence thing. Um, me and Amy were having a discussion about how there's this huge pressure on women in science, like especially uh, physics and maths, to like be excellent and have this like extreme excellence. Um, Whereas I feel like with male students, it's a lot more like they can just like plod along, get on with it. They don't have this pressure that they need to like outdo everyone to prove themselves. And um, I was wondering how you feel about this. I know like Athena talks about this in her book about how a lot of the, most of the role models that we have uh, as women scientists are these extreme examples of women who have won Nobel Prizes um, or like made these amazing discoveries. We don't have those role models that are just so to speak, normal scientists or everyday scientists. Um, <laughs> well, obviously we do better <laughs> now, but um, I was wondering if you think this, the, these two things link together and how we can like, prevent this from like, discouraging uh, women to make that step, I think, especially from A-level to degree level and then so on to uh, PhDs and stuff. Mm. Yes, do you want to? Yeah, I just wonder if it's about normalising it more and talking more about the people who you may not win Nobel Prizes and speak 80 languages and play 50 musical instruments, like just <laughs> putting those stories in your lectures and, and the, types of, the types of people who come to talk or give lectures or, or kind of networking and opportunities like that as well to show that there are lots of different people who've studied these subjects. I would slightly challenge it and say that I think that whilst we can laugh about stinky, cocky men, I think they also do feel this pressure on them to be excellent in these kind of subjects and also inadequate. I was, I was speaking to my friend who's, who was my best friend actually during my PhD and he's now at MPL. And he was saying the pressure is so huge. You know, when you're going for a, a fellowship or something like that, everyone wants it. And so I think, you know, this imposter syndrome, who, who feels included in, in these rooms, Physics does a really good job of making no one feel included. So I think if we, <laughs> if we made it a more inclusive and welcoming space, it would be just better for everyone. So I agree, let's normalize the image of who does science. But I think we should step away from thinking men feel really OK all the time, because I really don't think they do, even if they put that face on. Yeah. And I think we should think about the role of role models, actually. Yeah. Um, I think role model, uh, one of the best role models you can have is somebody who's just a little bit further along somebody you can see is actually in their final year of their degree and have got through and they can help you and they can mentor you and, and you know, make suggestions about you know, what you should do. Um, and indeed, when you're a lecturer, maybe somebody who's a reader and all that sort of thing. Um, but I, I'm a bit nervous with role models. As you say, they, they seem like gods. I mean, we've got Jocelyn here. What a wonderful role model. But I'm not like Jocelyn. I'm, I'm me. So I take... I'm, <laughs> I'm, you know, she really is fantastic, but I take and learn from everybody, right? I have role models all over the place who I totally respect. I wouldn't say I want to be them, but I learn from them, and I take the best aspects, and I, and I become me, right? It's my, my career, my life, and, and yeah. 
So here's where I'm grateful we didn't get on to my discussion of who all of your role models are. So I think <laughs> I'll take one more question in the corner, then we're going to have to stop. Um, hi, I'm a sixth form college student. I wanted to talk about um, the sense of failure in girls, and I think it's really interesting. Um, I have learning difficulties, and I come from a family of three girls. My parents have three kids. All three of us have learning difficulties, yet no one was diagnosed until last year, and my sister's 18, I'm 16, and my younger sister's 11. And, but we have a close family friends, and they have two boys. Both of them were diagnosed with the same learning difficulties at eight years old. Um, and we just, I, just, I think it's really interesting that in harder subjects such as STEM, where maybe you pick up on learning difficulties more than a subject such as drama, um, women or young girls tend to be quieter in class or be, feel less confident, maybe because they're too scared of the failure and you won't pick, on, pick up on those own difficulties because all the girls are not confident enough. Majority of the girls in the class aren't speaking and you're not able to pick up. Do you think that that's prevalent still in sort of higher education and such? Would you like to speak to this? Uh, yes, I want to say something generally about failure, which is uh, what, to am amplify what's already been said on that subject. So I, I think until I came here as a PhD student, I didn't feel like I was ever in a safe enough environment to admit I didn't know anything. But it's only by admitting you don't know something or you don't understand anything that you can possibly learn. That's the kind of one end of the spectrum of failure, if you like. So we, I think we need to, to have a bit of a, a culture shift on, on failure, as has already been pointed out, and that it's not the great negative. And it's very hard to say that here, in, particularly in Oxbridge, that it's actually an opportunity to do something better rather than to you know, dwell on what hasn't worked, dwell on where you could go from there in a good way. Uh, so we, I think a, a wider conversation about that and particularly in relation to women who, who perhaps feel it more sensitively than men or men who can't articulate what they're, how they're feeling, the difficult emotions they're experiencing and perhaps that's why it's exhibited as, as cockiness all of those kind of things can only be healthier for everyone if we can if we can feel more comfortable about the fact that it's okay not to know something or know how to do something or to get something wrong the first time you try it or even the third time you try it or whatever so i'm really sorry because i would love to keep all of this going for much longer but um i'm worried about keeping everyone from the coffee and the cake um we are going to wrap up now what i wanted to do to close is actually just ask each of our panelists if you could give you know one thing you would like to see us change at university in the next five years, and um, maybe if you've got lots, you can just pick your favourite <laughs> one. Um, but um, maybe for us to reflect upon going into the coffee break and then we'll, we'll close. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, I can say one thing, um, which is not really to do with teaching and learning or anything. It's about having some place to go to talk to somebody who's completely independent of your supervisor, your lecturers, your boss, the whole lot, um, that you can say what's worrying you, especially if you're being harassed or bullied or something like that. And I'm on a campaign right now to try and get an ombudsperson for the university that knows the university processes, can advise, um, knows the law, adv can advise on what you can do as far as um, your concerns are, con are concerned. So that's one thing I'm trying to do, but it's nothing to do with teaching or getting women into STEM. But it STEM, still impacts but I think the makes, community. Yeah, it <laughs> impacts the community. Yeah. Um, probably changing what we are teaching to make it more relevant for today and how we're teaching it and then also how we're assessing it. So we don't use things like exams, which are generally not very relevant for going into the real world. Um, I think I'd like to see uh, rewards for greater levels of kindness in science. Mm. Great. So I think um, <laughs> we will really wrap up now. Um, thanks to all of you yeah. for the great um, questions and discussion. I hope some of this will continue into the coffee. Um, let's thank our panellists. Um, <laughs>